Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you're well and uh, staying safe. Um, not much to report on the deliverable side. Hopefully, most of you are working away uh, at the 10th and final deliverable, uh, which will be due on Monday night uh, as usual. And then on next Tuesday, we will, uh, we will talk about the final project and uh, some interim videos that you'll deliver along the way showing us that you're making progress towards your final project, which we'll, you'll be presenting for a grand total of two minutes and 30 seconds uh, during an oral presentation in our exam period on Tuesday, December the 8th. Any questions about Deliverable 10? Anything that's not clear? No? Otherwise? Okay. We will return uh, to our four-part lecture uh, on robotics. So we're looking at the third and final class of interactive technologies um, in this course. <clears throat> what distinguishes robots from embedded technologies and more traditional interactive technologies like desktops and laptops and smartphones is that robots are able to move themselves. And as they do move themselves, they change the sensory stimulation they receive at the next time step in the same way that animals and humans, as they move about their world and interact with other objects and technologies, uh, influence the sensory stimulation that we receive at the next time step. Okay, so we started last time by uh, talking a little bit about why the development of robotics has lagged behind the development of computers and AI. One of the reasons is that uh, our attempts to build robots is usually inspired by looking at animal or human behavior. And when we look at animal or human uh, behavior, we tend to anthropomorphize and as we build a mental model of what might be going on in the head of the ant or the, or the human, we often over complexify our mental model. We assume more inner complexity in the animal than is actually there. And when we go to build that inner complexity into a robot, it doesn't work. So we ended last time by uh, looking at some hypothetical uh, robots and machines called vehicles described in Breitenberg's uh, book by the same name. And Breitenberg's goal here was to focus not so much on the internals of a robot, but rather its interaction with the environment. And we looked at a very simple example last time. We ended with a very simple example last time, which was vehicle 2A, which obviously has very, uh, a very little internal complexity. It has just two wires. One connects the left light sensor to the left wheel, and the second wire connects the right light sensor to the right wheel. And as we saw last time, if you flash a light to the front and right of the robot, more light will fall on the right-hand sensor, which means the right wheel will spin more quickly, causing the robot uh, to turn to the left until eventually it is uh, facing side on to the light. As the robot uh, curves away from the light, what happens to 2A? What happens to 2A as it now completes its curve and moves further away from the light? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. The way to think about this is if the robot is moving further away from the light, think about what's ha what change is occurring at the sensors. And given that change at the sensors, what change is happening to the motors and therefore the wheels and the speed at which the wheels spin, which affects the behavior of the robot. What happens is the robot turns away from the light source. Once it no longer sees the light, as Henry says, it will, it will uh, stop turning. So if we assume that the lights are not omnidirectional, meaning they only sense light in front of them, then of course, as it turns away from the light, as Henry says, no more light falling on the sensors, which means the wheels uh, stop spinning and the robot stops. Let's assume for the moment that that's not the case. Let's assume that the sensors are omnidirectional and they can pick up light from behind them. What happens in that case as the robot turns to the left and away from the light? So if the robot turns away from the light, now the light is, behi is behind the robot, but the, lights, the light sensors themselves are a little bit further away from the light. So what's happening, what change is occurring in the robot's behavior? Oh, 
Well, if you think about it, the light sensors are further away, meaning there's less stimulation on the light sensors. Light, less stimulation to the motors, meaning the wheels turn more slowly, and the robot will move slower and slower as it's moving away from the light. And at some point in the limit, as Henry said here, the robot will come to a stop. So in uh, Breitenberg's book, he refers to vehicle 2A as the coward. It's afraid of the light. If you come at it from the front uh, right, it will turn away quickly and then slow down. If you chase the coward from behind with a light, if you think about it, the light is approaching the robot from behind, meaning more light is falling on the light sensors, which means the wheels speed up and the robot will run away from a light source. Same thing if you come at it from the front left. Valentino Breitenberg was a very accomplished neurophysiologist. Why would he be calling vehicle 2A the coward? Seems like kind of a, a very uh, controversial term for such a simple machine. Let's have a look at vehicle 2B, which is exactly the same. We have two photo sensors or two light sensors on the front, two motors at the back, and we now have uh, contra Contralateral, contralaterally connected sensors. Contra meaning across and lateral meaning side. So as you can see, we have crossed connections here. In vehicle 2A, what we actually have is known as ipsilateral connections. So ipsa, same side. Okay. So in this case, if uh, we, we come at this robot with a flashlight or a light source from its front left, as you see here, how is this robot going to respond? How is this going to robot going to move at the next time step? Does the robot turn right, turn left, go forward, go back, stay still? Exactly. So this robot is going to turn towards the light because in this case there is more light falling on the left, uh, meaning that the right wheel uh, spins faster and it will turn towards the light as Henry says. So as, uh, as the vehicle turns towards the light, it's now at some point as it's turning going to be facing directly into the light. What does the robot do at that case? What does the robot do when it's directly lined up with the light source? The robot turn left, turn right, speed up, slow down, go back, stay still. Exactly. Well, it'll speed up because there is about the equal amount of light falling on both light sensors, so it'll move forward. As it moves forward, there's now more light falling on both sensors, which means both wheels move faster and it will accelerate. And if it's a naked light bulb, it will smash into it and destroy the light bulb. If 2A was called the coward, what do you think Breitenberg called vehicle 2B? If you had to name this vehicle, what might you name it? Perhaps, perhaps. So uh, Bradenberg referred to this as the aggressor, right? Clearly this is a machine that hates light sources and if it's able to, it will drive into them and smash them. Uh, if you Google uh, Bradenberg vehicle in YouTube, you can find a few videos of some people who made these vehicles out of uh, Lego, the Lego Mindstorms construction kit. Uh, pretty easy. If you have such a kit at home, you can make the coward or the aggressor in, uh, in just a few minutes. A very, very simple machine. But we get what you could imagine are the rudiments of useful behavior going towards or going away from uh, phenomena out in the environment in a very simple manner. If we think carefully about the interaction, this robot's interaction with the environment. Okay. I think I just gave this one away. So... That's okay. 
Vehicle 3A is the lover, so we're back to ipsilateral connections, same side connections. In this case, uh, in this case, we have uh, inhibitory connections. Inhibitory connections, mean it, which are indicated by the negative uh, signs here, meaning that if there is more light that falls on the sensor, the more that sensor inhibits the turning of the wheel to which it's attached. Yeah, so we're kind of inverting the signal. Less light that's falling on the sensor means there is less inhibition of the turning of the wheel. Yeah. You can probably see in this case that uh, if we come at this vehicle with the light source front left, there is more light falling on the left sensor than on the right sensor, which means there is more inhibition of the left motor than there is of the right motor, which means the left motor, the left wheel spins slower than the right wheel and the lever will turn towards the light. But the moment it turns towards the light, its action causes a sensory repercussion. The robot has pushed against the world and it now observes how the world pushes back, which is that as it's now closer to the light, there is more light falling on the sensors, which means there is more inhibition on the wheels, which means the robot will slow down in this case, the opposite of the aggressor. And it will slow to such a point that in Breitenberg's, uh, in Breitenberg's uh, words here, this vehicle loves the source in a permanent way because it will stay close by, it will approach the light and uh, stay close by in quiet admiration from the time it spots the source to all future time. We have the, uh, the vehicle standing in front of the light. What happens if we pull the light a little bit away from the lever? What will happen? We pull the light source away, there's less light now falling on the sensors, on both sensors, what happens? Does the robot stay where it is, turn left, turn right, back up, go forward? It'll go forward, right? There's You pull the light away, meaning there's less inhibition on, on the uh, on the wheels, it will speed up and then slow down again as it gets approach, approaches the light. So it'll move towards the light and stay facing it uh, as long as possible. Okay, again, very strange language. Let's look at vehicle 3B. This one's a little trickier, actually. Still uh, pretty simple. We have contralateral connections, crossed connections but we have contralateral inhib inhibitory connections in this case. If there is a light source to the front and left of this robot, what happens? In this case, does the robot turn left, turn right, speed up, slow down, go backwards, stay where it is? So as Khan says, this robot will turn to the right, it will turn away from the light. And when it turns away from the light, we have now less light in total falling on the two sensors. Let's imagine the sensors still uh, are omnidirectional, so the sensors are picking up the light that is now behind the robot. What happens at this point? What happens in this robot when there is less light in general falling on the sensors? Any ideas?
So in this case, we still have we still have inhibitory connections. So if it's turned to the right away from the light source, that means there's less light. And as Khan says, it will keep moving forward. There's less light, meaning less inhibition. Less inhibition means the wheels spin faster. So as this robot is turning away from the light, it will speed up and start moving away from the light. If we assume that this robot is in a, a general environment where it's relatively dark and there is just one point light source out here, it will speed up as it's moving away from the light and there's less inhibition on the turning of the wheels. If there is another light source uh, somewhere else in its environment, it'll move towards that light source, but as it gets closer to that this new light source, it will slow down because as it just happens by chance to be approaching this light source, that means there's more light falling on the uh, sensors, meaning more inhibition, it will slow down, slow down, slow down, and as it passes the light source, it will speed up again. Breitenberg re referred to this vehicle as the Explorer. It'll come to rest facing away from the signal source, or at least maybe come to rest or uh, slow down. One consequence of this is that the effect of the source, of the light source on the sensors is weakened, less inhibition because the robot is pointing away. If this weakening is sufficient, the motors could start up enough, it speeds up, to drive the vehicle away from the source. This vehicle, according to Bradenburg, is an explorer. It likes nearby sources all right. It will slow down because it's curious about them, but keeps an eye open for other, perhaps stronger sources, which it will sail towards, given a chance in order to find a more permanent and gratifying appeasement. Very, very strange flowery language for a very uh, serious uh, scientist to be using. Let's have a look at one, uh, let's have a look at one last robot. As you can see, this one's a little more complicated. This robot has a total of eight sensors on the front, on its front, four pairs left and right. So it has a pair of light sensors as we've already seen. Assume that these are crossed excitatory connections. So the left light sensor is uh, positively connected to the, uh, sorry, the left light sensor is positively connected to the right motor. The right light sensor is positively connected to the left motor. Assume that we have a pair of temperature sensors like we saw in vehicle one. Let's assume in this case we have uncrossed or ipsilateral excitatory connections. So same side connections with little positive signs, excitatory connections. Assume that it has oxygen sensors. This is kind of interesting. Uh, more oxygen means more of a signal going into the wire. Uncrossed inhibitory connections and organic material. Let's assume that it can detect the amount of organic material nearby. So if there's a rotting fruit that is giving off a whole bunch of complex chemical signals, remember that Breitenberg originally studied uh, the brains of fruit flies. If it detects organic material is nearby on the left, we have crossed inhibitory connections. Okay, you'll notice that that means that for each wheel, there are four incoming wires. Some of these wires may be sending a positive signal. Some may be sending a, a negative signal or a small signal. Let's assume that we take all four signals that are arriving at one motor, and we're gonna take the average of those values, and whatever that average is, we send that to the motor, and that dictates how fast or slow the motor moves. How does this vehicle behave? Even with this slightly more added complexity, it's hard to think about how this robot will behave. It's also hard because I haven't told you of what environment it's in, but let's assume that it's in, it's, an envi it's in a relatively complex environment where at different places, different positions in that environment, there's more or less light, it's warmer or colder, there's more or less oxygen, there's more or less organic material. In Breitenberg's view, analyzing this robot, you now have a, a vehicle with really interesting behavior. It dislikes uh, high temperature, turns away from hot places, uh, but at the same time seems to dislike light bulbs with even greater passion since it turns towards them and destroys them. The light sensors have crossed excitatory connections, which is the aggressor. 
On the other hand, it's uh, on the other hand. Uh, sorry, misprint there. It definitely seems to prefer a well oxygenated, well oxygenated environment and one containing many organic molecules, since it spends much of its time in such places. More oxygen or organic material, more inhibition of the wheels, meaning more slowing down of the. The wheels. It will slow down when it's in high oxygen environments, or when it smells uh, when it smells a chemical signal being given off by some rotting organic material. Uh, however, it is in the habit of moving elsewhere when the supply of either organic matter or oxygen uh, is low. Okay, so let's just go back to the explorer here. Why? or the lover for that matter, why would Breitenberg use this language? Clearly, vehicle 3B is not curious. It's not consciously exploring its environment. The lover doesn't love. The aggressor doesn't hate. What point is Breitenberg trying to make by using this language? As the author of this book and the reader of this book, we know that clearly this, this particular vehicle is not curious because we can see what's going on inside the machine. There is no curiosity circuit. There is no love circuit in the lover. There is no hate circuit in the aggressor. There is no fear circuit in the coward. Why use this language? What point is Breitenberg trying to make? As Bryce mentions and Thomas mentions, or Bryce mentions, we project complex emotions and motivations onto simple systems. We know they're, they're simple. As Thomas says, it's hard not to anthropomorphize robots and their behavior. Imagine you didn't know what was inside all of these vehicles, and I showed you a series of YouTube videos of Lego robots exhibiting this behavior. Again, you may know a simple Lego robot probably doesn't love or hate or is, is curious. But if we look at animals that exhibit these kinds of behaviors, you might say the cockroach is afraid of light because it runs away from the light. Is the cockroach afraid? Very difficult for us to be able to attribute subjective states or emotions uh, onto other animals. And the same thing with robots. Most of us are sure that robots, simply because they are simpler, do not have these emotions. For most of us, hard to know with animals where emotions start on the, on the scala natura, the, the ladder uh, of life. Very, very difficult thing to do. The one thing that most of us are sure of, of course, is that we, the human species, we do love, hate, be curious, be afraid. We are different. There may be other animals that also share these emotions, but somewhere there is a dividing line, and on this side of the line we have a subjective states, and on the other side of the line we, they, do, they don't. There is clearly much discussion in our society, more so in recent decades, about where that, that line uh, is. However, what is it that defines that dividing line? What is it that's going on inside our heads that allow us to explore, to be curious, to love and to hate, and that does not exist, at least not yet, in machines? We'll just spend a minute or two thinking about this. Um, what is the difference between you and a Breitenberg vehicle? You may shy away from certain stimuli like impending homework or towards other stimuli like Netflix and fast food. You may be able to inhibit those behaviors. So in some ways, we're like Breitenberg vehicles. We're attracted to certain stimuli and we tend to resist or turn away, literally or figuratively, from other stimuli. What's the difference? What do we have that the vehicles lack that allow us to love, hate, be curious, be afraid. 
Why do you feel comfortable anthropomorphizing other people? For some, for some people, the answer is the soul. There is some immaterial, uh, there is some immaterial substance that imbues us with subjective state and emotions. Free will, we are, we are free to choose uh, what stimuli, uh, whether to override uh, our base instincts, as Sarah mentioned. As we saw in the Libet experiment, free will is a little, is tricky. If you're a materialist, meaning that you believe that we are simply electrical activity uh, in the brain, that there is nothing additional like a soul or a free will, it's harder to distinguish ourselves from vehicles. Even if you're a materialist, there are clearly lots of differences between us and Breitenberg vehicles. We have many, many more wires than the vehicles do. Most vehicles have two or uh, eight connections. Um, humans have 10 to the 11, on the order of 10 to the 11 neurons and 10 to the 14 synapses. That's a lot more neural hardware. Is it just a matter of degree? Is it simply that we have, there, we have more complexity? Is there some complexity level that leads to internal subjective state? Uh, as Khan mentions, maybe hormones are a part of that uh, as well. So there may be things other than neurons and synapses, like a soul, free will, hormones that allow us to do so. Of course, we don't have an answer at the moment. We may never get an answer to this question. So this is a little tangential to our discussion, but what is important here is thinking carefully about the interaction of the robot. In our discussion of vehicles, we've had to, by necessity, describe what's going on inside the robot, but we've thought more carefully about what action the robot takes and what change in its sensors that motor that uh, th those motor signals cause. Remember all the way back to the beginning of the course when we talked about John Dewey, the reflex arc. In Dewey's opinion, it's the action that comes first. The moment you act in the world, you generate change, and some of that change you can sense with your sense organs. And that relationship, sense uh, action, through the environment to future sensory stimulation. That provides the raw material for learning, coordinating, building a mental model of whatever it is that you're literally or figuratively pushing against. So up until now, we've been talking about humans pushing against interactive technology and observing how the interactive technology pushes back. In robotics, we're inverting that. We are looking at the technology itself and thinking about building that technology so that it can push against the world observe how the world pushes back and learn from it or coordinate its action and do or do whatever it is that we're designing this technology to do. So we, interaction is still central here, but the interaction, we're viewing it more from the point of view of the technology than the human observer. Okay. So again, just to drive home this point, um, Breitenberg in this book, and if you continue on, there's a series, uh, I think of 12 vehicles uh, in all. So again, a fun read if you're interested in these, these sorts of things. Uh, from Breitenberg's point of view, the, the issue here is perspective. So anthropomorphization, our, our, our desire, our, our difficulty in not anthropomorphizing comes from a behavioral perspective meaning we're looking at the human or the animal or the robot or the interactive technology from a distance and all we're seeing in many cases it's behavior when you're interacting with an app or interacting with the robot you usually don't know what's going on uh, inside and if you don't know what's going on inside you tend to uh, you tend to settle on a complex mental model and often that it is an overly complex mental model which means in many cases, as we saw when we talked about mental models, it's hard to predict what that machine will do. If we actually dive inside the machine and see what's going on, at least for most well-designed machines, often the internals are simpler than you might think. So this, if we now think about not just observing machines, but designing them, we can think about trying to design an agent, uh, a, a relatively simple agent with the right wiring, so that if we put that simple agent in a rich environment, we get rich behavior. So it's the, it's the richness of the environment that leads to rich behavior rather than richness of architecture, putting complexity inside 
the robot. If you think about any of the vehicles we talked about and you imagine a field of light sources, some of them dimmer, some of them brighter, and you then run your mental model of vehicle 2A or, 3, or 3A, you can imagine it tracing a very complex path through this, through this environment. You can produce increasingly rich behavior in even these simple vehicles by enriching the environment. Okay. So again, that has implications for design. So if we're building a particular interactive technology, which is self-motile, able to move itself, we want to think not just about what we can put in the machine. And we talked about this when we talked about packed analysis. We don't want to start by thinking about how to pack our robot with very complex neural network controllers. We want to think carefully about the context of that robot. What environment is that robot being designed for? And we want to think about the richness of that environment and how the agent may be able to uh, interact with it or exploit it. And that will often lead to simpler designs where the agent is exploiting its interaction with the environment rather than sitting passively and thinking complex thoughts about how to do what it needs to do in its environment. Okay, so a lot of things we've heard already when we were thinking about designing interactive systems, but mapped onto self-motile interactive technologies. Okay, we're going to take uh, five minutes now and I want you to put some of these ideas uh, into action. So we're going to imagine a hypothetical situation here. Um, you have been contracted uh, to de uh, develop uh, a robot swarm capable of automated construction. We're going to assume that you're going to place a bunch of robots. All those robots have exactly the same controller inside of them. So each robot has the same body and the same brain. We're going to assume that each robot has three pairs of sensors. So uh, a pair of light sensors, front left and front right, a pair of heat sensors, left, front left, front right, and a pair of sound sensors, front left, front right. We're, we'll assume this robot has a gripper on its front and on the inside, uh, inside of the gripper, it's got touch sensors, so it knows whether it's in contact with an object or whether it's gripping an object. If there's an object inside the gripper, those touch sensors are firing. If there is not, the touch sensors are not firing. Okay, so we have a total of uh, six sensors Plus the, plus the touch sensors. So if you want to assume a touch sensor on the left side inside of the gripper and the right inside of the gripper, that's probably easier. Now you have a pair of touch sensors. We have four pairs, a total of eight sensors. Assume at this construction site that we're going to distribute a bunch of objects. So these are objects that are dropped at random in the construction site, but we're going to assume that there are lights attached to them. So we are instrumenting our environment a little bit to scaffold automated construction. We're making it easier for the robot swarm to work with the objects in this environment. We're gonna place a single heat source somewhere in the environment. Uh, and that's where all the objects should be collected. So basically the construction at this point is just find all the objects with lights on them, pick them up and bring them to the uh, heat source and drop them off there. As these robots are moving around, they should also avoid one another. We don't want them crashing into one another. And that's, that's, this is a, our set of requirements, our very simple set of requirements for our robot swarm. I want you to, either with a pen and paper or just typing briefly uh, on your computer, I want you to sketch out the controller for this robot. You're going to create this controller by thinking about a nested set of if-then-else statements. So to get you started, here's an example of a particular if-then clause that might be useful. If, uh, where the if clause is usually going to be something to do with the sensor. So if the, the touch sensors are firing, that means the robot is touching or holding an object. If that's true in the then clause, we're going to trigger a particular Breitenberg vehicle. So basically you can think of each robot in the swarm as acting temporarily as a particular Breitenberg vehicle. And which vehicle it is, is dependent on its sensor values. So in this case, if, <coughs> if it's holding an object, it's going to connect the heat sensors contralaterally 
to the motors with positive connections, excitatory connections. So if, if it's holding the object, how will the robot be, uh, react to heat in this case? So the robot is holding is holding uh, is holding an object, and it's now reacting to heat front left and front right. How does the robot react to heat when it's holding an object? It's going to move towards the heat source exactly. So you can see that's the that's p a part of what we want the robot to do. If the robot is not holding an object, so imagine you we add an else clause here. What Breitenberg vehicle should should it trigger? So if uh, if touch sensors are not firing, the else statement. How would you wire up the robot in that case? How should the robot behave? And what stimuli should it be re responding to in that case? Okay, well, I'll let you think on this. Um, some other things, uh, some other things to add into your control program here. So, as I mentioned, you're gonna you're gonna sketch out a series of these if-then-else statements, and they can be nested. So, obviously, there there are lots of things that can go on here. So, if you start at the top of your controller, the top of this if-then-else hierarchy, with touch sensors firing or not, and the then clause, we have this uh, this Bradenburg vehicle in the else clause. You might have another Bradenburg vehicle, or you may have another if then else uh, set of clauses, which is what kinds of things does the robot need to deal with if it's not holding an object. Some other things you can put into your if clause here. You can add a threshold, meaning if uh, if a pair of sensors registers a value above some threshold which is going to be a value. And since this is a hypothetical situation, we don't know what those values are. You can just assume they're something. You can just put threshold in there. So for example, if the amount of light detected by the sensors is above some threshold, then do something else. Else, if light is below that threshold, else do something else. Okay, so go ahead and sketch some of these if then else statements very briefly like I did here. Um, I'll give you a few minutes for that. We, uh, at the end of those couple minutes, for those of you that are sketching out this if then else uh, on your computer, I'd like you to just, w when I give you the signal, just to copy and paste that into chat. I don't know how that'll come out format wise, but we'll see if we can scan some of your ideas and see uh, collectively what you've come up with. Okay, good luck. If you have any questions about this uh, exercise, again, just uh, type them into chat.
give you another minute. Okay, if you have an idea of how to approach this problem, go ahead and, and copy and paste either your entire controller or parts of your if-then-else hierarchy uh, into chat. Let's see what you came up with. So Amanda has dropped in some code that would help the robots uh, avoid one another. So again, this comes from thinking carefully about the robot's uh, environment. Um, obviously, as the robots are moving, they are making sound. And as they approach other robots, uh, the volume is going up in total. So we can use the sound sensors as a proxy for proximity and use that uh, to avoid one another. So in Amanda's uh, code snippet here, uh, if the sound sensor is on the left, then left motor, right? So more sound on the left means more spinning of the left wheel to turn away from the robot. Uh, Thomas has some ideas here about uh, heat threshold. So if the heat threshold is above some value, drop the object. You're close enough. Uh, you're close enough to uh, the heat source. If the lights, if the light threshold is above some value, you're close enough to an object with the light on it. Go ahead and use the grippers exactly. Khan has some ideas here. Exactly, so again, use the sound to avoid, avoid other objects. Great, I, I think you're on the right track here. So again, in, we're, we're writing relatively simple controllers, just series of if-then-else statements. If we were to do this in reality, there'd be a lot of other details that we'd probably have to add in a little bit of complexity. But the key uh, uh, to approaching this as an HCI designer is to think carefully about the robot, uh, about the context of this roboticized construction site. Right? We're using the fact that the machines make sound to allow them to not collide into one another. We're focusing mostly on the environment and potential interactions between the machines and their environment and working backwards from there to create a simple controller. Okay, so that concludes uh, lecture 20. We're going to move on now and talk about uh, this, uh, some ideas from philosophy and psychology that influence the design of robots, uh, and again, that are related to HC HCI. We're going to talk about two aspects of cognition, and both of these aspects of cognition, again, are not about the internals of cognition. We talked about that when we talked in our psychology section, when we talked about attention, memory, uh, and so on. Situated and embodied cognition are aspects of our cognition that rely on the fact that we are situated in the world or embodied. We have a body. Okay. It seems like an intuitive concept, but let's unpack it uh, a little bit. Um, so in this little cartoon here, uh, I've got the physical world on one side. So we have people interacting with one another, where the output of from one person sound produced uh, by our articulatory tract become auditory input to the other person, they respond, and so forth. Computers, uh, when people, uh, people are interacting with computers, we're obviously crossing this divide between the physical world and the virtual world. Computers, uh, when they're talking to one another, of course, sending packets back and forth, and they are also interacting with each other, but they are interacting with each other in a different way 
from the way in which animals and people and robots interact with one another in the physical world. As we'll see, people and animals and the robots we just talked about are capable of embodied cognition and situated cognition, but computers are not. Okay. So let's start with embodied cognition. Uh, as the name implies, this means that you simply have a body. You are embedded in a physical object or a series of physical objects, and you can use those to exert forces uh, on the world. And when you do, that interaction with the environment changes your sensory stimulation. Of course, all uh, computers and smartphones and any devices are also embedded in a physical object. Here's an old school uh, desktop machine. The reason why most traditional computers are not considered embodied is because although they have a body, although they have a physical body, they cannot use it as a tool. They cannot actuate it or move it or influence the environment in any way except in an indirect manner. So a computer, a laptop or a desktop, can influence the external world by projecting something onto the screen and quote unquote hoping that someone will react with a mouse or keyboard. Or it can send a packet to another computer over the internet, but those are all indirect, indirect ways of influencing the physical world. Okay. So embodied cognition is this idea that comes from philosophy that says the way you process information is affected by the fact that you have a body. A corollary of this idea is that if you have a different body or you have two agents that have different bodies, they're going to process information in different ways. This will also become important. So non-embodied technologies are fundamentally passive. They're waiting for feedback from other computers via packets or they're waiting for the human user to do something. If you are embodied, you are active. You're able to use the, the physical properties of your body as a tool. Okay, situated cognition is not is more of a focus on sensors than motors. Another distinction, a way to think about distinctions between embodiment and situatedness. Embodiment has mostly to do with motors and action. Situatedness has to do with sensation or perception. So situated cognition, at least fr coming from psychology and philosophy, is the idea that the way you process information is affected by the fact that you are directly sensing things from the world. Again, traditional technologies like laptops and uh, desktops receive input from the, output, uh, the outside world, but that, that uh, incoming signal is mediated. It is uh, coming from a keyboard or mouse and it's transformed for the, uh, for the computer, it's put in an event queue and the computer can then process it uh, uh, when, it's, when it's ready. Situated cognition also implies that you're sen mostly implies that you're sensing the world directly. You are aware or you're able to detect immediate changes in the physical world or some phenomenon in the physical world. For some of you in the leap uh, in the leap project, this is the first time you've come up against uh, event-based processing. So we're writing in, in JavaScript where certain events occur, like someone uh, uh, typing on the keyboard or pressing a button. In the case of ML5 and your KNN, the KNN issues a promise. So the KNN goes off and runs its own process to uh, make a prediction. And when it's ready with that prediction, when it's fulfilled its promise, it will immediately trigger the calling of the function uh, got results. Right? So event-based processing is on, is on its way towards situatedness. A further step beyond event-based programming is embedded devices, which have uh, which is some code that is connected directly to a sensor, and that sensor is, is sending real-time signals uh, into the device. So we're assuming that embedded devices, they don't have control over the, in, uh, the incoming signal, it's arriving immediately, and they don't have to wait for a signal from the device to change. Right? So a computer sort of buffers input coming from the keyboard or mouse and processes it internally when it's ready. An embedded device is very different. So a specific example we've already mentioned about embedded devices would be something like uh, a wireless sensor that senses changes in light levels. The, those light levels change regardless of whether the device records the data uh, or not. 
If we look at a computer, there is data inside the computer memory. That data may have been captured from a webcam or a mouse or a keyboard, but once it's captured, that data doesn't change and it's processed by the computer when it's ready. That's the idea of situated cognition. Okay, um, we're going to talk for the next few lectures about complete agents. Complete in the sense that they are both uh, Sorry, I skipped a slide. I skipped a slide. A complete agent, we're going to assume, is short form for anything. This could be a human, an animal, a Breitenberg vehicle, a robot, an autonomous car, a drone, anything that is both situated and embodied. It is an interactive system, either biological or artificial, that is directly sensing things out in the world and is able to act, either move itself or influence the uh, the external environment immediately. All complete agents, again regardless of whether they are biological or artificial, have a number of interesting properties. Um, in the reading for today you'll see that there are five uh, properties that are discussed, but we're only going to focus on three of those five that are relevant for HCI. So if you, uh, if you end up designing uh, machines that can move themselves and sense the world directly, you are designing a complete agent. And like our discussion about the Breitenberg vehicles, we want to think carefully about the ways that complete agents interact with their environment and how we can exploit those to design relatively simple machines. The first and most obvious property of a complete agent is that it's subject to the laws of physics. It has a body and physics is acting on that body. But uh, Non-embodied devices like desktops and laptops, they are obviously embedded in physical objects and those objects themselves are subject to the laws of physics. But those non-complete agents, those non-embodied agents can't do anything with that information. Complete agents generate sensory stimulation rather than passively receive it. They generate sensory stimulation through behavior. If you're designing an interactive technology that needs to do something, you need to think about how to get it to move so that it generates the sensory stimulation it needs to decide, did it do the right thing? Did it do the wrong thing? Can it learn from that sensory stimulation? And so on. Finally, uh, through behavior, the robot, uh, the robot or the human or the animal or the drone can leave a temporary or lasting impact on the environment through its own behavior. Can we take these properties and exploit them? We, can we use them to get away with a simpler machine that does what we want it to do? Okay. So uh, often if you think about these things being subject to the laws of physics, so heavy things uh, are sort of, uh, have inertia and they won't start moving unless they actually do something, it's often easy to think of these as hindrances, things that are making it more difficult for the agent to do what we want it to do. A more lightweight object, a more lightweight robot often seems a better thing than a heavier robot which is has more inertia, takes more effort to get going, and so on. As HCI designers, we're going to instead try and view these properties as potential facilitators rather than hindrances of the agent. Can we exploit them to get the agent to interact with other complete agents or interact with people? Which we're going to see when we get to lecture 22 and 23. We're going to look at some, some robots that were designed carefully to allow them to interact with people better, to be more social machines. And we're also going to look at robot swarms. So robots that are designed that they're able to interact well with other robots. Okay, let's start with, uh, let's start with uh, feature uh, property number one of complete agents, which they're subject to the laws of physics. Can we exploit this rather than fight against it? Assume another hypothetical challenge here. You're going, to divide, you're going to design a device that can record information or data, environmental data such as pre air pressure, temperature, chemical composition from all or many levels of the atmosphere of Saturn's moon Titan. So assume you're working for NASA, uh, you're developing a, ser a, a set of technologies that are going to be deployed to Titan. We want to get information about the atmosphere of Titan at many different uh, altitudes. We'd also like to collect some aerial images and images from the ground. 
we want information at different levels of the atmosphere, we could, in theory, use a satellite that does not enter the atmosphere, but very carefully sends a reflecting radar or other uh, returning phenomenon to different depths. So by tuning radio, uh, radar emissions, we can, get in, we can bounce a signal back from different levels of the atmosphere, and we can then analyze that return signal to indirectly infer pressure, temperature, chemical composition at different levels of the atmosphere. Or solution two, which is the actual solution that was used back in 2005, which was to clearly uh, exploit the fact that a, uh, uh, a probe dropped into the atmosphere because it is uh, because it has mass it will drop through the atmosphere and as it's dropping through the atmosphere it can direct it can sense and record directly at that at that altitude the information that we want and obviously take pictures on the way down and if the probe survives the landing to take pictures on the surface this particular lander is simpler than a satellite where that satellite is going to have very comp uh, is going to have a very complex uh, controller that is going to have to determine how to send out these return signals the probe itself um, that we're describing here is is not that simple it clearly had to have some complexity to be able to take these measurements on the move but again in this very uh, in this situation here we're trying to exploit the fact that we can use gravity to allow something to drop through the atmosphere and collect the information we need as we go. Okay, um, obviously this is not a hypothetical situation. This actually occurred back in 2005. Does anybody remember what this probe actually was or was called? Any space geeks out there? So these images were taken by the uh, the Huygens probe back in uh, back in 2005. Uh, it was mostly designed and run by a science team uh, at Cornell. Uh, I was very lucky to be a postdoc at Cornell at the time and got to go to a special viewing session where we got to sit and look at a, a blank screen. And uh, as we were watching the blank screen, it very very slowly started to fill in. Uh, with this image. So it was incredibly exciting to be able to sit in with the science team and, and watch these images come back from the surface of uh, Titan. Okay, let's have a look at, uh, let's think about two of the other uh, features or properties of complex uh, agents, which is, uh, sorry, sorry, complete agents, which is again this idea that they generate stimulation, sensory stimulation through action and they can affect their environment through action. Let's imagine that we want to try and create uh, some technology that is able to recognize objects uh, in an image. And we'll simplify this task by simply asking this technology to determine where the object's boundaries. This is known in computer vision as the image segmentation problem. We want to try and segment or pull out objects in the foreground from the background. Um, it was one of the most difficult problems in computer vision. It took decades and decades to get a computer to do this. Why is it so difficult to recognize objects from, from an image? Hopefully for most of you, the minute I flashed up uh, this slide, even if you didn't read Marilyn Monroe at the top right, hopefully most of you would have immediately recognized this is a picture of a human being, and for some of you, you may have recognized which human being this is. It's trivial for us to recognize, not only segment uh, objects in the foreground from the background, even when we're looking at a two-dimensional scene, but thinking about thinking is misleading. It took decades of research and computer vision to be able to do this. Why is it so difficult? What is it about this task that's so difficult? Why is computer vision in general so difficult? We now have machines that can recognize uh, objects or animals or people uh, in a photograph. Part of it is because it's not a 3D object. Right? You're, we're, in computer vision, we are in, in a sense hobbling uh, our computers by only giving them a subset of stimulation. Right? We're giving them a two-dimensional 
uh, representation of a three-dimensional scene. But if that's true, why is it so easy for us? You can still do it, even though you're looking at a two-dimensional image. Why? Imagine that we took a very young human child, we strapped them down, we did not allow them to move, and we presented millions of uh, photographs to them and said, this is a human, this is an animal, this is a tree, and so on. It would obviously not be a great way to treat the child. It would also probably not be a good way to allow the child to learn to recognize visually objects uh, in their world. If you ever watch a young human child, they will not sit passively and look at objects around them. They will reach out and grab those objects. As Khan says, computers don't have things like our eyes. That's true, but we can easily put uh, a pair of cameras on a robot and ask that robot to look around its environment uh, and learn. Humans learn about the world around them not just by looking at those objects. We are primarily visual creatures, and uh, as we become older, we do a lot of our problem solving just by looking at objects in our environment, not by physically manipulating them. But developmental psychology, the study of, uh, of human children, suggests that the act of manipulating an object early in life is scaffolding for being able to recognize an object at a distance later in life. Given that hypothesis, this was an idea that was actually tested uh, using the baby bot robot um, by a set of uh, researchers in Italy and MIT. In this case, I'm going to show you an embodied approach to solving the image segmentation problem. Compared to a more passive approach where we feed in millions of images to a, a deep neural network. Okay, so how does BabyBot work? Well, first of all, you can see that it has two eyes like we do. So BabyBot has two uh, cameras, so it's getting a stereoscopic uh, image. Um, BabyBot has one arm, which you can see here. BabyBot can send signals to its arm, so it can move its arm. Uh, and we're going to put a whole bunch of objects in front of BabyBot here. And basically, we're going to just start with the image segmentation problem. Can BabyBot uh, figure out what exists in the world around it? Can it segment the fruit from the background of the table? We're going to make one other assumption, which is we're going to take the continuous video feeds coming from both eyes, and we're going to throw away most information in those video feeds. The only information we're going to take is we're going to overlay the two images and ask in that uh, combined image which pixel is reporting motion and which one isn't. So uh, at the moment, probably most parts of your visual field are not moving, but there's probably a little bit of movement on the screen at the, at the center of your field of view. Imagine that all of the color bled out of uh, your vision, all of the texture disappeared, everything that wasn't moving faded into the same featureless gray field, and only things that were moving were uh, shaded, were, were visible. So here's a little cartoon example of this idea. So BabyBot basically at this point in time sees nothing, just a uniform gray field. Let's assume that BabyBot then um, randomly sends some signals to its motors. And when it sends signals to its motors, suddenly it sees a blob of motion in its visual field. BabyBot is called BabyBot because we're going to assume that this robot is like a baby. It has little to no knowledge of itself or the world around it. Okay, so the robot has sent uh, has sent these commands, random commands, to uh, its arm. It doesn't know it has an arm, it just knows that it has this thing called a motor or it can send signals to something and something happens. The moment that the baby bot stops sending signals into, uh, into the motor, then the arm stops and this, blo this, bl this blob in its field, the blob of moving pixels, disappears and everything goes gray again even though its hand is in front of it. 
Baby Bot randomly sends signals to its arm, and suddenly that blob appears again. It stops sending signals, the blob disappears, and so on. What can Baby Bot infer from that relationship with the world? What raw material is available? What, what, could, what could Baby Bot learn from that fact? And what are the relationships that it's detecting that allow it to learn this thing? We haven't even got to touching the fruit yet. The ro robot baby bot knows nothing about fruit. Uh, it's just it's just detected that there's cert this certain blob that appears whenever it moves, and that blob disappears whenever it stops sending commands to the motor. If BabyBot had to come up with a name for this phenomenon, blob appears when I send commands to the motor, blob disappears when I don't send any commands to the motor, what might be a good name for, for that phenomenon? Create arm, May, yeah, maybe. So maybe, uh, so we've got a verb in there, create an arm. So it knows how to bring this thing, let's call it arm, into existence by sending commands to it. So we're gonna focus on the, no, the noun for a moment. Let's call this arm. So it knows that there is this thing called an arm and it knows that it has control over it. It can create, or let's, let's maybe just say manipulate it. It can change the position of it. That's about all it knows. It knows something about the shape of it. So BabyBot could trace around the edge of this blob of motion and it says this thing that has this shape, it's an arm. And the definition of arm is not just a geometric description. It is a description about a relationship between action and resulting sensory stimulation. It's that loop, right? There's this thing called arm that appears when I when I send commands to the motors and disappears. I have control over this thing. Let's replace the word arm with self for the moment. So baby bot is going to call this thing self. And self by definition is a blob of motion that appears and disappears and that process is under my control. Okay. Obviously, one of the most important things for babies or baby robots, which is to understand this concept of self. What is the boundary of me and the rest of the world? We're assuming that BabyBot is just kind of randomly sending signals to the motor and from time to time it stops sending signals. And as it's playing or exploring, let's imagine that this blob of motion suddenly comes into contact with the apple and now the blob of motion from one time step to the next suddenly changes. There was a certain, uh, the certain blob and now the shape of that blob has increased. What can BabyBot infer about this new piece of the blob? If the blob called self suddenly as it's moving if suddenly the shape of that blob changes and baby bot stops uh, stops moving the hand stops moving self stops sending commands to the motors perhaps that blob doesn't disappear if it's come into contact with the apple with enough velocity maybe it jostles the apple and the apple rolls for a second before coming to a stop that, from BabyBot's point of view, is a new phenomenon. BabyBot has never experienced this before. All BabyBot knows up to this point is it can create or destroy blobs, as Bryce says, create arm or destroy arm, by sending actions and then stopping them. Now something new has occurred. What is that new thing? What label might BabyBot give to this new blob that does not disappear immediately when baby bot stops uh, moving its arm.
So we're assuming that BabyBot now knows about one concept, one thing called self. That's it. What is this new concept? It's not self because it doesn't obey this property of disappearing when the motor commands stop. What might be a good term for this other phenomenon? As Khan says, surrounding or world or other or non-self. Whatever it is, it's not self. Remember, we started our discussion here by image segmentation, trying to find uh, objects or segment objects out from the background. By moving, BabyBot has uh, already kind of solved this problem. It doesn't need to detect the edge here. The, the object immediately jumps out because at least in this simple scene, it's the only thing that's moving, assuming BabyBot has stopped moving its, uh, its hand. So if we asked BabyBot, uh, asked quote unquote, because BabyBot doesn't have any language. If we were to ask it what uh, non-self is, it might respond with an adjective, which is, let's assume, round. Where BabyBot says it's things that have this blob shape. This is what I've seen. Everything that's non-self is round. We've got three minutes left, so let's just do one more, one more step in BabyBot's journey to knowledge here. Let's assume BabyBot continues moving its hand around and comes into contact with the grapes. The hand comes into contact with the grapes. What happens in that case? BabyBot might start by seeing something similar. It sees the blob of self and it's moving at random and now suddenly the shape of the blob increases and there is this new, from our point of view, grape-shaped blob and it's pushing against it. As it's pushing against it, something new is going to happen that BabyBot has never seen before. What is it? It's pushing against the grapes. What happens from BabyBot's point of view? If it pushes against the grapes and stops pushing, as long as it's pushed with enough force, maybe the, the grapes kind of just jiggle for a moment and BabyBot sees that and knows that this thing is moving even though it has stopped moving. So it knows this new thing is part of world or part of non-self, but it's also different from the other round non-self thing that it saw before. How is this new piece of the world different from the piece of the world that BabyBot had experienced when it was interacting with the apple. If you think about it, this shape, the blob surrounding the, the grapes, that outline is going to change. As BabyBot is pushing it, the grapes are deformable and it's causing that deformable. Uh, thing. So as Alex mentions here, this is going to lead the baby bot to start to notice there are different properties here of this object and one of those object, uh, one of those properties as Alex mentions is uh, soft. So now baby bot says, okay, there's this thing called world and there seem to be different things in that world. So maybe baby bot invents the world, the word things and some things are non soft like the apple, and other things are soft like the grapes. We've gone from image segmentation now into a whole other part of the physical world. You'll notice that this ability to learn about and see things in its environment is very different from looking at, uh, at uh, photographs. I think we'll stop there. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. You're working on deliverable 10. Uh, I know everyone's very busy this time of year, so I wish you uh, good luck with all your various uh, homework assignments. And uh, I hope you have a good weekend, and we'll see you back here uh, next Tuesday. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye.